morning, church. Come on, if you got breath in your lungs today, you've got a reason to praise. And wherever you are right now, whether you're in your house, whether in your at work, whatever, I just want you to turn it into a place of worship tonight. Because he is worthy of all the glory and honor and praise. And Lord Jesus, we've come to lift your name, Lord God. We've come to exalt you, Lord Jesus. We worship you.
We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible. Oh, every giant will fall. The mountains will move every chain of the past. You've broken into over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible with you. Come on, if you believe that tonight, give them some praise where you are right now. tonight, Jesus. Higher than the mountains that I face. You are stronger than the power of the grave. You are constant in the trials and the change. One stronger than the power of the grave. You are constant in the trials and the change. Just one thing, one thing remains. One thing remains. Oh, no. 
good evening, church. If you haven't checked out our Facebook post today, I want you to do that because you'll see a, a parking lot full of kids who didn't have the opportunity to throw their caps into the air. The graduating class of 2020, we were really fortunate enough to host the uh, graduating class of Patapsco High School here in our church as they paraded around Dunlock in their cars, tooting their horns and just rooting each other on. So we want to pray for them this evening, but I want to share with you something. And I remember 48 years ago when I graduated Dundalk Senior High School. Yes, that's 1972. Sorry, I'm giving you my age, but that's okay. I remember after all the hoopla, I sat on the back step of my aunt's house, and, and I felt totally lost. I had, no, I had no understanding of what was happening next. Yes, I had a plan. Yes, I knew what I was going to do. Yes, I knew what college I was going to. But the questions still remain. And I sat there for a while. My father finally came out and I said, Dad, am I going to make it? Am I going to be okay? Is it going to work out? He put his arms around me. He said, you'll be fine, son. You'll be fine. And there's kids out there today who graduated, who threw their caps in the air, and they had that same question. They had that same concern. They had that same burning thought in their heart, is it going to be okay? And when you think about what's going on in the world today, they have even more reason to do so. So I'd like right where you're standing, right where you're sitting, right where whatever you're doing, just reach your hand to the screen and let's pray for this graduating class of 2020, not just for Patapsco High, but the graduating class across our nation. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up to you these kids, Father, these young people, Lord God, the future of our nation, Lord God. And yes, some, some have a definite direction, a positive direction, and they know exactly what they're doing. But yet, Father, there are those, are those young people that aren't sure, that are questioning in their mind, is it going to be okay? Am I going to make it? Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask God that you would just touch them in a mighty way. Lord, whether they're, they, they claim the name of Jesus Christ or not, Lord, give them a sense of peace, a sense of confidence, Lord God, a sense of touch, Lord, from the Master's hand, Lord Jesus. God and I specifically pray for our graduating class here from Eastern Assembly of God. Lord, I know these young people, Lord God. I see them in and out of our aisles, Lord, and I can, I can call them out by name. But, Father, you know who they are, God. And I ask, God, a special touch. God, that you would reach into their hearts and give them their, the blessed assurance that you will be with them. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before Pastor comes, I have a special announcement for you this evening. Uh, next week, I have the privilege, uh, Pastor's giving me the, the privilege of his pulpit to begin our summer series. And I'll be speaking on Psalms. And I can tell you that it's not what you think it is. So stay tuned. We'll be coming to you next week for the next four, perhaps five weeks. And we're going to be teaching through the book of Psalms. God bless you. Thank you so much, Pastor. Amen. Thanks, Dan. And I look forward to uh, gleaning from that teaching. Uh, we really appreciate Dan over the last number of summers has done a summer series for us. And you will be blessed by tuning in. Let me remind you, please, a couple of things before we get into tonight's lesson, and you're going to want to stay tuned. You might want to get some paper so you can take some notes as we dive into this a little bit. First of all, if you have not heard for some reason, we are back in church. Yes, you heard that right. Welcome home. We had a wonderful welcome home service this past Sunday. It was well attended. I know some of you are a little nervous about coming, uh, but we are taking every precaution we know to take to make sure that you're going to be safe. Quite obviously, if you've got severe medical conditions and you're waiting, we understand. Uh, but if you're in good health and just a little nervous, just come check it out. There's nothing like being with God's people in God's presence learning more about the Jesus that we love. Uh, we do ask, and perhaps if Pastor Chris is, is watching, he can put the link down there. We do ask that you go through and reserve a seat only to make sure we don't have more people in any one service than we can safely distance. 
And so uh, by doing that, if, the, if one of the services filled up, you can know you can still come. You'll just have to come to the other service. And so uh, we are doing that. And you can go to our website is the best way to do that if you don't see that link. And you'll see it right on the front page. Also, we are going to be continuing staying online on Wednesdays. Listen, next week, if you have teenagers, Pastor Chris is going to be next week doing something outside with the teenagers. But they are going to begin meeting on Wednesdays here at Eastern. And so we're just going to give them all the space for right now. Again, we're trying to start up slowly to keep everybody safe. Also, I believe young adults will be starting um, next week after either Wednesday or Thursday. Pastor Kelsey's working on that and just kind of polling them to see which night will work the best. So we are slowly gearing things up. Also, I want to say thank you for your faithfulness in giving. You have been absolutely amazing. But please don't stop. We need your continued help. And I'm believing God is just taking care of you. If you have a special need and you are part of Eastern, if you've got a financial need, you need grocery money, um, you haven't got your unemployment check yet, please give us a call. We have collected some funds to help those who are in need. And uh, we can help you if we don't know of your need. So tonight we are going to bring to a conclusion uh, the series we've been doing on the great moves of God in America. And uh, we've covered so far the first great awakening of the mid-1700s, the second great awakening in the early 1800s. And by the way, all of these messages are on YouTube. What's nice about YouTube is they're all congregated under a heading. If you go to our page and, and just click under videos or series, you'll find them. You can go back and catch the ones you've missed. We talked in week three about the prayer revival of 1857, which was absolutely amazing. And then we jumped overseas and talked about the revival in Wales, England, about 1900. And then last week we talked about the Pentecostal revival, which happened about 1906. And out of that revival, the Assemblies of God was formed, of which we're a part, in 1914. Tonight I want to talk about the charismatic renewal. If I could describe the charismatic renewal in just a sentence, it would be this. And this is where we're headed tonight. The Holy Spirit moving in denominational churches, resulting in people being baptized in the Holy Spirit and used in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And Here's what's exciting about the charismatic movement. During the Pentecostal revival that we talked about last week, if you got baptized in the Holy Spirit and you went back to your denominational church and said to your denominational pastor in 1906, man, I had an encounter with God, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I now speak in other tongues. In 1906, your denominational pastor said, bye-bye, you won't be doing that here. And Pentecostal, small Pentecostal churches were started because Pentecostal believers were being pushed out of their denominational churches. During the charismatic movement, the Holy Spirit invaded denominational churches and people were touched mightily by the Holy Spirit in those denominational churches. Now, on my part, listen, I was saved at the very tail end of the charismatic movement. If you're going to put dates on the charismatic movement, it would be about 1960 to 1980, in the early 80s. I got saved in 1979, right at the very tail end of that. But I remember as a new believer, someone told me about a, a prayer meeting in someone's home not too far from where I lived. So I went over there and I met Elmore and Kay Hudgens, who were spirit-filled Episcopalians, and they were holding a spirit-filled prayer meeting in their home. It was awesome. Think about that. I remember hearing Pastor Tom Trask, who I was a youth pastor for in Detroit, Michigan, tell, now this, this happened just before I got there. I went there in 1986. This had happened in the early 80s. There was a group of nuns who actually went to the early service at Brightmore Tabernacle because they had been filled with the Holy Spirit and wanted to, they snuck over to the Pentecostal church early on Sunday morning to get their filling and then went back to the Catholic church and did their ministry. So let's talk about the charismatic movement. The groundwork for the charismatic movement was laid in the 1950s with the formation of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International. 
Later, the women got involved with Women's Aglow. Some of you old-timers may remember Women's Aglow. This was an association of Pentecostal businessmen. Chapters began to spring up all over the country. And what happened is Pentecostal believers would bring some of their denominational workmates, and their workmates would hear stories of businessmen who had been touched by the Holy Spirit, and it began to spark a curiosity in the hearts of denominational believers that perhaps there's more. Another important figure in the charismatic movement was a man by the name of David Duplissy. And he was born and raised in South Africa. Here he is in this picture right here with some of his denominational friends that he had made. And in 1936, Smith Wigglesworth, if you don't know that name, you need to learn that name and read about him. Smith Wigglesworth was on a preaching tour in South Africa and prophesied that God would pour out his spirit upon historic churches and that David Duplissy would be part of that. And Smith said that David Duplissy would see things that no man has ever seen. Fast forward, he saw Catholics get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Possibly something no man had ever seen before. Well, David Duplissy moved to America in the late 1940s, and he began to gain friendships with denominational pastors. Doors opened for him in the National Council of Churches on Christ, the World Council of Churches, and he discovered many people who were curious about Pentecostal movement of the Holy Spirit, and many of those people that he met later became part of the charismatic movement. He was also invited to become a Pentecostal observer at the Second Vatican Council of the Roman Catholic Church. He was, listen, he was a bridge builder, and he became known, David E. Pelosi became known, now carries the title of Mr. Pentecost. How would you like that, to, to, to know that down to history you'd be known as Mr. Pentecost? Let's talk about bridge building for just a moment. What is the opposite of being a bridge builder? The opposite of being a bridge builder is living on an island by yourself. A bridge builder would be someone who seeks to build a bridge to meet some people on the other side to build a bridge. Now listen, you can see this principle at work right now in light of things that are happening in our culture. In fact, I'll tell you a story. Pastor Chris is going to tell you more of this in person on Sunday morning. I hope you're here. But in Manassas, Virginia, just an hour and a half from here, there were some protests that turned ugly on Saturday night. Four officers were injured, five arrests were made, some police cars were damaged, and a few businesses were also damaged. On Sunday night, Chapel Springs Church, a large church in Manassas, got involved. Their worship leader, who happens to be a man of color, led the dialogue. The police were there. They talked. There was positive discussion for hours. The church bought 200 pizzas for everybody who was there. And that church decided that they were going to build a bridge into those demonstrators. And by doing so, keep things calm. A lot of church members showed up that Sunday night. And it became a wonderful, wonderful thing. Did you know that Jesus was a bridge builder? He built a bridge from heaven to earth, for one. And then once here, he built a bridge to, to minister to people that the people of his day wouldn't have any contact with. Tax collectors prostitutes, people who most Jews shunned, he built a bridge and ministered to them. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says this, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And you know what that ministry is? Listen, it's very simple. We are seeking to reconcile people with God and people to each other. That's the ministry of reconciliation. I have a few questions before we move on tonight. How can you build a better bridge to your neighbors? What, what could you do? Come on, don't, don't wait for them to build a bridge for you. You're the one who's saved. You're the one who, who has a hold of the bridge builder, Jesus. How can you build a better bridge to your workmates? What, what could you do to show them? That, that you care, that you have empathy towards them? How can you build a bridge to people different than yourself, which ultimately could lead to racial 
reconciliation. One of the things that I've done over the years as pastor here is when a new pastor shows up here in Dundalk, I will personally not just make a phone call, but I will go knock on the door of the church and seek to meet them and invite them to our pastor's fellowship here in town and, and seek to, to cross a bridge. It doesn't matter. Uh, as long as they love Jesus, it doesn't matter to me what denominational name is in front of them. They're part of the kingdom. Can you say amen? David Duplissy, Mr. Pentecost, was a bridge builder. Let us follow his example. When California, Reverend Daniel Bennett, who was the pastor of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in 1960, think about this. He's standing behind his pulpit. Church is full. And he says, I've got something to tell you, church. I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I speak in other tongues. Well, it, it wasn't received too well, but other people in the church received before he was kind of pushed out. He became the pastor of another church in Seattle. A Lutheran by the name of Larry Christensen was touched and shared what God had done. A Reformed pastor by the name of Harold Bredneson also received and shared the message. And if you kind of follow what God is doing, he's basically touching people in all kinds of denominations, and they are now becoming leaders of the Pentecostal message in their denominations. Also involved in the charismatic movement that spread into the Jesus culture was Chuck Smith, the founder of Calvary Chapel. Let's see if I can bring up the slide here. I might need some help up there. If anybody's up there, I am stuck. There it is. There's Chuck Smith in the corner. And his church grew so fast of hippies being saved, he had to build a tent in the parking lot uh, while the larger church was being saved. So many hippies got saved, and many of them were musicians, that at one time he actually had 15 different music groups in his church. Out of that sprang Maranatha music. Anybody remember Maranatha music? Maranatha singers? And it's interesting because when they first started putting out songs, they were rejected by many in regular church culture because these were hippies taking their style of music and turning it into Jesus music. But can I be honest? The church began to sing them. A lot of churches began to sing them. Many of them we still sing today. There are now 1,800 Calvary chapels in America. In one of those Calvary chapels was John Wimber, who started the first vineyard church, and it grew into a denomination of churches. There are now 2,400 vineyard churches worldwide. Let me just take a moment to talk about the Jesus movement inside of the charismatic movement because there's a great lesson to be learned. So hippies began to get saved. But many believe this movement was cut short. In other words, God had intentions of doing more, but it was cut short because of the church's inability to love those hippies as they walked into a church. Think about what church culture was like in the, in the 60s and early 70s. And picture someone walking in in a pair of sandals, jeans, T-shirt, and long hair. Do you think they might have got a few strange looks in 1968? Those of you who are in church culture. And what happened was, listen, it, it, the church misunderstood an important principle that I want you to get tonight. Okay, listen. First, Jesus catches them. Then Jesus cleans them. All right, stick with me. Jesus catches them. Jesus cleans them. But in church culture sometimes, we want Jesus to clean them so they look like us, smell like us, and then hope that he'll catch them. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And instead of just loving on those hippies and just understanding they were very sincere, they were very hungry, God was doing something, come as you are, sit down, we love you, man, we just want to introduce you to Jesus there was pushback on the church's reception of those hippies and may have cut short uh, what God wanted to do. Matter of fact, I wrote it down there just to make sure you got it. God cleans you after he catches you. How many of you are grateful tonight that when you came to Jesus, you didn't get a list of, oh, this is what you have to get, do and get right before you get saved? 
Don't work that way. Come on. We, we need Jesus to empower us to get it right. So we come to him as we are. He cleans us up and then empowers us to live right in a process called sanctification. You say, well, well what about church discipline? Listen, church discipline does not apply to newcomers. Come on, somebody. Oh, yeah, a newcomer who's making a big scene, you might have to get an usher to say, hey, could you quiet down? But church discipline applies to people who are followers of Jesus that begin to go backwards, and you want to correct them and make a statement to them to grab their attention so they'll come back to Jesus. If you understand that, type amen or say amen. we got a few folk in the house tonight. Listen, every guest who walks through the doors of a church is an opportunity to show the love of Jesus and point them to Jesus. Think about this. How on earth are you going to love the multitudes in the world if you can't love the visitors that God sends to your church? Can I remind you of something tonight? The Bible does not say the world will know you're a Christian because of your political affiliation. The world will know you're a Christian because of your activism. The world will know you're a Christian, here's what it does say, because of your love one for another. God, help us to get it right. You know, we pray as a church that God will send people in, that God will save people, and and they'll begin to come. But God, help us to love them well when they come. Here's the scripture. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples. Help me now. If you love one another. Notice an important word in that verse. If. That if depends on you and your openness. Well, in 1967, the charismatic movement broke into the Catholic Church. And here's how it happened. Some of the Catholic layman faculty members at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh had read David Wilkerson's The Cross and the Switchblade. The book came out in 1962, the movie in 1969. So this was a few years after the book came out. And listen, if you are watching me tonight and you have never watched the movie The Cross and the Switchblade, you need to watch the movie. Yeah, it's a little old. Yeah, you can tell the movie's a little old. But the message is so very powerful. It's the story of David Wilkerson, who was pastoring a small church in rural Pennsylvania, feeling called to minister to the warring gangs in New York City. The faculty and staff had a three-day retreat focusing on the Bible and the Holy Spirit. David Mangan attended that retreat, and he talked about, he wrote about what happened to him. Here it is. He says, when I walked into the chapel... I was completely overcome by the power of God. I found myself prostrate on the floor. Little explosions were going in my body. I knew it was God. I knew it was the Holy Spirit. When I went to thank him, I started speaking in a language I didn't know. I later found out that was the gift of tongues. So at Duquesne University, 1967, On a student spiritual retreat, David and others got filled with the Holy Spirit, and God began to move. And matter of fact, the Duquesne weekend, this is a picture, the only picture I could find of, uh, I don't know if this was all of them or some of the students who were there, uh, at that retreat that weekend, took on worldwide significance because it was here that Catholics first experienced Pentecost. Well, news spread to Notre Dame University in South Bend, Indiana. At summer school, God began to move and carried it to other universities. And listen, in 1968, Notre Dame held its first renewal conference with emphasis on the the Holy Spirit. That year, 150 people attended. In 1977, 20 years later, they had 45,000 people on the campus of Notre Dame to, tr- to seek and open up to the work of the Holy Spirit. Somebody say, praise God. God was at work invading. Come on. How do you know God's just looking for some hungry people? C- c- can I tell you the truth tonight? Say yes, honey. I just need one yes. All right, she said yes. 
God will pass by a Pentecostal church and visit a Methodist church if that's where he finds the hungry people. Just because you have the word Pentecostal in front of your name doesn't mean you're hungry for the things of God. I would hope, church, that through this quarantine, through this worldwide pandemic, God has stirred something in you and he's emptied you of some things and made you realize the futility of putting your hope in this world. And it's caused you to cry out and say, God, don't pass us by. Move in our midst. As I mentioned earlier, and I want to reemphasize, the difference between the Pentecostal movement and the charismatic movement was during the Pentecostal movement, people were booted out of denominational churches for having experienced the Holy Spirit. And now, 60 years later, 50 years later, the Holy Spirit is, is invading those churches. And people are experiencing the Holy Spirit right in those denominational churches. Some well-known charismatics, just a few. I, I'm just naming a few. There's many more I could list here. Kenneth Hagin and Rama Bible Fellowship. Benny Hinn. Mike Bickle of the International House of Prayer. Probably the most well-known right now at this time is Bethel Ministries in Redding, California, Bill Johnson. Coming out of the charismatic movement was also the prosperity gospel. And I want to talk about that for just a few moments tonight. Probably the most notable name in the prosperity gospel was and is Kenneth Copeland. Now, prosperity preachers link godliness with money. In other words, if you are close to God, God will bless you with money and possessions. They tend to brag about their exorbitant possessions as sign of their closeness to God. They will seek to raise money by promising you that you'll also be blessed like them by giving into their ministry. A while back, Kenneth Copeland made the news by requesting donations for not just a new jet, but the best of the best, $54 million. When he was asked, well, why can't you fly on a commercial airline? He said, well, when I get around regular people, I lose my anointing. How many of you are glad Jesus didn't feel that way? Come on, he was around regular people, and what he did when he needed to get refilled, he broke away from the crowd and spent some time in prayer. He found his filling there and then came back and ministered to the crowds. Look at what the Bible says. One passage of Scripture demolishes the theology of prosperity preaching. Here it is. 1 Timothy 6. If anyone teaches false doctrines and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and the godly teaching, he is conceited and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil, suspicions, and constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth, now catch this, and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. What does this, these verses say about linking godliness to financial gain? It says men who do that are in error. They've been deceived. Now, now listen for a moment. I know you're going you're gonna to hear this and then you're going to shake your head. I'm going to explain. I believe in prosperity. I believe God wants to prosper you. But listen, that prosperity goes way beyond and doesn't always include finances. Hey, I'm prosperous in my spirit, man. I have the Holy Spirit living there. I mean, i got God in my spirit. You cannot prosper any more spiritually than, than being a Christian with the Spirit of God living in you. Come on, is anybody out there prosperous in their spirit, man? You, you should be. Come on, somebody. I, I'm prosperous. I, I have Jesus. I'm prosperous. I have a beautiful wife. I have a, a wonderful family. I, I feel blessed by God. I believe God wants to bless you, 
But when you simply limit that blessing to the area of finances, you misunderstand so much of the blessing of God and what it means. You you limit the blessing of God to only finances. You see, the Bible says the blessing of the Lord brings wealth and he adds no trouble. But, But the question is, what does wealth mean? Is it simply money? Or are you wealthy if you have Jesus? Are you wealthy if you have a wonderful family? Are you wealthy if you have health? Come on, somebody. Are you wealthy if you find contentment in what you have and say, I've got all that I need? Maybe that's true wealth. You say, Pastor, do you believe God blesses generosity? Well, the Bible is plain God blesses generosity. God can't bless stinginess because you've got to put something in God's hand to work with in order for him to bless it. You want to bless marriage? You need to put your marriage into God's hand. You want to bless family? You need to put your family in God's hand. That's why we have child dedication, encouraging parents to get their children in God's hands so God can bless what's in his hands. Can you say amen, honey, tonight to help me out? Thank you. Come on, you need to get in his hands. God doesn't bless stinginess, but you need to get it in his hand. And the same is true with finances. God can't bless what you can't put in his hand. Now, now don't don't understand that when you you give to God, it's not like I give God 10 and get back 100. God can choose to bless back. You can't outgive God, but how God repays that goes beyond anything we can imagine. I mean, would you rather have $1,000 or 1,000 souls? Think about that. I do know this. I do know that generous Christians are blessed. They're blessed, but, but that blessing goes beyond financial. I could take you to Honduras with me. And a lot of those Honduran folk don't have much in the way of finances. But they are blessed spiritually. They're blessed with wonderful families. The hand of God is upon them. Come on, somebody. Turn to somebody in the room and say, man, I'm rich in God. And you know what God gives you? There's no sorrow to it. There's no regrets to it because it's from the Lord. So going back to the charismatic movement, can I tell you that God is still moving by his spirit? I believe he's still looking for some hungry people. Think about about the magnitude of what God did during that movement. He invaded. He invaded denominational churches where there were hungry people. Filled them with the Holy Spirit. Gave them a testimony. That movement didn't just sweep across the United States. Really, around the world. Still going on in, in many places in great power. South America, Africa. I mean, God is powerfully moving. And I want you to believe with me that that wave is coming on the other side of this, that God has used this to get our hearts in the right place so he can pour out his spirit. Would you do this with me as we get ready to close tonight? Would you just lift a hand to the Lord wherever you are, in your living room, wherever you are. If you're driving a car and you're listening, you're excused from this. But other than that, just lift a hand. And in your own words, I want you to tell the Lord that you're open and you're hungry. For a movement of the Holy Spirit in your life. Come on, the Spirit of God, he, he, he looks. He's just looking for somebody who will say, Lord, it's me. let it be me, God. I want to be filled by you. I want to be used by you. I want to be a vessel that the Spirit of God can work in and work through. Maybe you're listening tonight and you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit with physical evidence of speaking in other tongues. Listen, you don't have to be in a church for that to happen. That can happen right in your living room right now just as you surrender. Just like that young man we talked about on that Catholic retreat was was overcome by the Spirit of God. So it can happen again. Come on, let me pray for you tonight. Father, I pray. That you raise up a group of hungry Christians. I believe you're already doing it, Lord, right here in our midst. Father, that we long for you to work in us. We long for you to work through us. Lord, when we come to church, yes, we enjoy the friendly faces, the fellowship one to another, but the greatest thing we're looking for is the presence of God 
and the touch of the Holy Spirit. Because, Lord, that's what real wealth is, Lord. Being filled with you and being able to say, I have all that I need because I have the Lord and he's working bountifully and beautifully in my life. Move among us. Lord, I'm asking you even this Sunday as we gather together, go before us, God. Meet us in this place in a powerful way. Let word get out. Not only is Eastern Assembly open, but God is powerfully at work. Let it be for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church. Keep walking with him and keep that hunger after him.